Hi, I'm Dr. Moor Baja, astrodynamicist, space environmentalist, and associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. And I listen to the Cold Star Project. The show is for entertainment purposes only and is not intended to be what is termed professional advice. The Cold Star Project is proudly presented by the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech is a supporter of the OPEX Society, and Jason Gannigan is a member of its board of advisors. Talk with us at Cold Star Tech to find out more about the OPEX Society and what we can achieve together in your organization. Or just visit opexsociety.org. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Today's guest is Dr. Gordon Ressler. He's very well known in the space community and in the national security field. Uh, as being the space logistics guy. He's very interested in um, modularity and robots in space. That is the name of his company after all. And he's been on the show a few times before and I enjoy these conversations very much. I learn something new every time I talk with Dr. Ressler. So let's jump right into it. Let's describe our topic. You spoke at the State of the Space Industrial Report uh, meetup that happened between national security figures and space industry folks uh, not too long ago and talked about commercial logistics systems and the importance of them. Let's describe that topic, Gordon, from your perspective. Uh, what does it mean? What do they consist of? What do they enable? So as you've heard me say before, we, we kind of have this disposable mentality in space today. Satellites aren't serviced. They're not upgraded. They're not repaired. Uh, similarly, we throw away, uh, you know, upper stages of launch vehicles after a single use. Um, obviously, SpaceX is recovering their first stages. They plan to recover the Starship, which will be very exciting. Um, but there's a lot that can be done with reusable systems that stay in space, right? So you can move things from orbit to orbit. You can store things in orbit to use them at the appropriate time. So, so you're not at the mercy of the schedule of launch vehicles and that sort of thing. Um, so, so the idea is to create a, an infrastructure in space, a logistics infrastructure that's very similar to all those that we find as the bedrock of our terrestrial economy, right? Shipping lines and trucking lines and UPS and FedEx and all those kind of logistic systems that make everything else tick, right? That's, that's the idea um, of, of, a, of an in-space logistics infrastructure. Okay, what, what are we missing now? We obviously need kind of Lego pieces to, to do that. Um, and why is it a problem that we're missing that stuff? Um, I mean, cost savings is one reason. The, the thing that we're missing to start with is space tugs, right? Uh -huh. Things to take objects from one orbit to another. If you could, for example, if you could tug a satellite from low Earth orbit to geo, um, you, you reduce the energy requirements on launch vehicles. So that brings your launch costs down. Um, actually, you know, even with low launch costs, Starship is going to create you know, an amazing change in our space infrastructure as a whole, but it's a low earth orbit vehicle, right? It's not mm -hmm. designed to go beyond Leo, unless you refuel it, what, you know, and use it to go to the moon or something like that. Um, wouldn't it be cool? I mean, wouldn't SpaceX, for example, like the ability of, of vehicles to come and take parts of a hundred ton cargo mm -hmm. to other orbits, right? Um, so, so, you know, in space transportation vehicles, AKA space tugs are, are a key thing that's needed to go to, to support those, you're going to need fuel depots, mm -hmm. right? So it, it takes a trip out to geo and back or some other orbit and back, and then you got to refuel it. Um, you can decouple its schedule from the launch schedule mm -hmm. with fuel depots, right? So that's the second important thing. And then the third important thing is, um, platforms that host payloads mm -hmm. like the international space station does today so on the exterior of the space station there are pallets with numerous instruments and sensors on them and that sort of thing you can you can test your equipment in orbit to to make sure it works in the space environment you can collect useful data and those sorts of things um, that is a great paradigm and it's one that could be accomplished on platforms that don't have astronauts on them mm -hmm. right that payloads are simply delivered and, and they're robotically plugged in and that sort of thing. Uh, each one of these components, the tugs, the platforms, the fuel depots have been looked at 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's economic good reasons to do them. They're going to save people money once we put them. In. They're also going to make the system a lot more responsive, decoupling one schedule for another. You know, today we have this launch environment where every launch vehicle is chartered. There is a payload, which, which may be a bunch of smaller things glued together, but one payload, one rocket, or one primary payload and some secondary payloads. But if the primary payload slips, the launch slips and everybody's mm -hmm. costs go up, right? Mm -hmm. We can decouple those things with this more flexible logistics system. Uh, you, you benefit in terms of, of getting things where they need to go in a timely manner. And also you, you should be able to reduce costs for, for all parties. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And we know there are companies working on bits and pieces of this, right? Orbit Fab for the gas stations in space. I think uh, Joel Cercel, uh, maybe with Transantra, Astra, and certainly Momentus. I think we're working on the space tug idea of pulling people up mm -hmm. from one orbit to another. So there's pieces, but who knows how fast <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, how competently. Well, and how well, place. who knows yeah. how fast and who know, knows how well they work together, mm -hmm. right? The idea is... Right. Um, you know, you know that if if your envelope is less than a half an ounce, the post office is going to deliver it for what is it now, fifty three cents or something like that. Um, you know that if your cargo will fit inside a shipping container and it weighs less than what sixty thousand pounds or something like that, you they don't care what's inside it. Uh, that's the kind of flexibility. That's the kind of of responsiveness that we need in space. Right. Yeah. And you've always talked about the importance of modularity in the development of systems and robots in space, <laughs> which is your company name also. But uh, this this idea. Thanks for, thanks for the ad. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> this, this idea. Um, I mean, it won it won World War Two, right? Instead of uh, highly tuned custom tank war machines manufactured by the Germans, the Soviets and the Americans did this with with modular parts that. Uh, in, in our case, some farmer could make in the back of a barn somewhere and send into Pennsylvania for assembly, right? Who would build an airplane that you uh -huh. can't upgrade the avionics over time, right? Uh -huh. who, who would build a car that you can't uh -huh. change out parts? And, and I mean, you know, that, that, but that's why we build satellites. So that's, uh -huh. that's the thing that we need to change. Okay. You mentioned containers, and I know this was a big thing in your talk uh, at, at the event, and I want to cover it again here. Um, this was, you know, I'm an operations management guy. And so, of course, the development of the box was covered, uh, you know, in the 90s, in the mid 90s when I took that program. Uh, what is a space container? Uh, folks, uh, this is about like uh, creating a, a container that can be loaded um, onto a ship or an airplane and off and it connects right onto a truck. It is the trailer of the truck, basically. Uh, and, and before this happened, you used to have to load and unload everything from the ship to the docks and you know all those longshoremen working, right? Um, one of my grandfathers was a longshoreman. And uh, this kind of thing maybe eliminates jobs, quote unquote, but it increases, like it speeds things up so much, right? Um, so what does a space container look like? And why is this concept so handy? So let's, let's think of two possible things that the container could be. One of them is mm -hmm. propellant. Right, mm. which, which we've probably mentioned before is really important for making space more flexible and useful and that sort of thing. And avionics or hardware is any kind of hardware. Maybe, maybe someday we'll have modular reaction wheels, modular mm. Star Treks, whatever, whatever you want to replace, maybe even modular solar panels. Um, so you need, you need three interfaces on either one of these. You need an interface to the launch vehicle. Mm. You need a manipulation interface so that the the in space thing the space tug or whatever can can manipulate it can can grapple it take it from one place and install it and then you need the interface to its final destination and i'm sure we can think of similar interfaces on like shipping containers right like you have an interface for an 18 wheeler you have an interface for the crane to put it on the ship and, and you have the doors that's that's the third interface right okay. putting stuff in there so uh, with propellant, there, there are various requirements on the propellant interface to make sure it doesn't leak, basically. Um, uh, for avionics, you want to make sure that if you have, ex you can't have exposed wires that connect to a satellite system in space because there will be uh, charging from the solar wind and that sort of thing that can cause uh, discharges that are disruptive. So you have to protect 
those uh, connections, but you have to be able to open it at, at the right time and, and to connect things to it. So each one of them has some fairly special uh, space specific requirements, but really just the three interfaces are what you need. Uh, and then you, you look at your uh, spectrum of launch vehicles that you're thinking about using, and you say, well, how, how do I interface to those? Can I, can I develop a concept? So the light band, for example, 24 inch band where you can, you can put anything up to a few hundred kilograms on the side of, a, of an adapter ring and, and take it up there. Um, that's a perfectly good interface to the launch vehicle, right? Um, in terms of interfacing electronics to satellites, uh, there, there have been some of uh, those interfaces that are developed. Actually, uh, in 2007, we demonstrated such an interface on Orbital Express, the DARPA experiment, where a, two modules, one was a battery module and the other was a processor, were plugged in to the, the surrogate satellite, and they both, they worked, right? So we know how to do this. You know, we just have to have to make it happen. Okay. How important do you think logistics and space is in terms of our ability to compete with China, who is racing to apparently do everything? It, it is the single most powerful thing I can think of to maintain, you know, the American leadership in space, uh, to maintain the ability to set norms, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do things that lead to the peaceful uses of space. It's the single most important thing I can think of. It allows us to put technology in orbit much faster, mm -hmm. right? It's easier to build a box of electronics in it and a couple of interfaces than it is to build an entire integrated satellite. And it's mm -hmm. cheaper and it's faster, right? So we can start getting things up there to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, right. It also gives us the opportunity to partner with uh, nations that are just getting into the space business, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if uh, Namibia is interested in an earth staring payload and that sort of thing, we can say, you know, you don't have to build a complete satellite out of there. Just give us your telescope and we'll host it on one of these, these hosting mm. platforms in space. Your costs are lower. Um, and, you know, it, it, it creates goodwill internationally and that sort of thing. So there, there are aspects to all this uh, that are very powerful. It will also help us to um, respond to undesirable events. For example, suppose that uh, a space system gets crashed by a cyber attack. Um, send up a module that you can plug in and reboot the system or whatever you need to do. Uh, so, so there's, in, in terms of this international competition in space, I think it's extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I agree that the idea of modularity and quick disconnect and reconnect, that the rate of change or the pace of, of improvement is only going to increase, right? And so being able to have a platform up there that you can pop things in and out of and replace quickly uh, and upgrade sounds like a great idea to me. And avoiding the bottlenecks, right? So mm -hmm. launch can sometimes be a bottleneck, right? right? And it Testing can sometimes be a bottleneck. Uh, the supply chain can be a bottleneck. You know, I you have to wait two years to get a titanium fuel tank. Two years, right? Um, if you can, if you can do these things in a in a scheduled manner, you know, like the airplanes, like airlines. You know, you, I I want to go to uh, Texas tomorrow. Oh wait, my schedule changed for a day. That's fine. There's another airplane that's going to take me there the following day. Well, that's not the way it is in space right now. Right. If your launch slips, everything slips. Um, and so getting getting away from that is very desirable. Okay. So, uh, so are we going to have government pay for all this? Or how do you envision funding to work for developing these commercial logistics systems for space? It is clear that no government agency or even adding up pieces of their budgets can make this happen by themselves. Um, this, this should be primarily uh, something that is owned and operated by the private industry, just the way shipping lines and, and air cargo and that sort of thing are private, that the government leverages on a regular basis, right? So I think there are three things that government can do to help make this happen. The okay. first is to announce, we, we want to see this and we want to help it, help it happen and, and possibly providing some seed funding 
I recall the, uh, you know, the COTS program, which is the first really large scale demonstration of a public private partnership by NASA. It resulted in two new launch vehicles, right? For a total government investment of half a billion dollars, right? How much have we put into the space launch system? Um, and the, the quid pro quo is that the government doesn't write all the specs. Mm -hmm. right? They say, we want something to do this basic stuff. You figure out how to do that and we will pay you this amount of money. And we see the government being customers for that. NASA couldn't promise that there was gonna be commercial resupply of the station. And they couldn't promise that they were gonna have commercial crew but they alluded to it and they said, it's definitely in our roadmap. They can't promise it because the Congress hasn't appropriated mm -hmm. the funds past the, you know, the given calendar year or fiscal year. But um, so the first, you know, so there's a government saying we want it and possibly providing seed funds to get it started. The second is uh, continuing the R and D that the government has been doing that makes this uh, more feasible. For example, the Orbital Express program that I alluded to and my old program at DARPA, Robotic Servicing of Geosynchronous Satellites, developing many pieces of the technology that will be useful for this. And then the third thing the government can do is um, the, the advanced contracting. I mean, you know, put, put things out there to say, in the next two years, we're going to want, want to deliver X things to GEO or wherever. Um, and and how far does this logistics system extend? I, I really never even mentioned that. So a single system could support commercial satellites in GEO, could support the gateway at, at uh, L1. It could support lunar surface operations. I mean, once we have a habitat, uh, you know, a more or less continuously occupied habitat on the moon, the logistics requirements are gonna be far greater than, than what you know, we have in the, in the loop now. So they could simply pay a private entity, maybe to bring things to the gateway and then there's some government operated lander that goes down, or maybe it's commercial, all commercial, that sort of thing. So those three things, support with possibly initial seed funding, um, continuing the R&D and advanced contracting, or at least announcements of, of contract opportunities. I think will attract the private cap, and there's plenty of money out there in the private sector. It's just a matter of convincing them that, um, there's a reasonable revenue opportunity that the technology is not science fiction and so on. <laughs> right, yeah, and as we know, folks outside the space industry often have a pretty skewed and limited vision of uh, what's going on in there. Um, by the way, folks, Dr. Ressler mentioned the uh, past DARPA program. Um, he was a program manager that uh, he headed and, and has had work continued on it afterwards. And he and I have discussed uh, this program um, on this and that makes space boring news show that I did, uh, and I'll try and link to this below. If I if I don't, please message me, <laughs> and remind me, and I will uh, make sure that that gets up there. All right, Dr. Ressler. Well, I appreciate you doing this very much. Uh, it's it's been a great education, and um, for those wanting to hear the original uh, state of the space industrial report presentation, I'll link to that as well. Thank you. And Jason, I want to thank you for what you're doing here. You're you're creating a body of knowledge that people can access about all the new things that are going on in space and the opportunities that are there, uh, both for revenues, but also to, to keep our nation strong and secure. Right. So thanks for doing it. Thanks for creating this forum. You bet. Thanks for listening to today's discussion. If you're interested in the order in which things are done, this is a very important thing for us at Cold Star Tech. It's called process engineering, process improvement. And the fact of the matter is the way you line things up and the order in which things are done is critical to the outcome of your business. We are interested in operational excellence at Cold Star Technologies. You know, I'm a board member of the Operational Excellence Society. Cold Star Tech's a bronze level supporter of the OPEX Society. Um, highly recommend you go to opexsociety.org and go and take a look at some of those articles. Or get Joseph Paris's book, uh, the founder of the OPEX Society, State of Readiness. It'll change your mind. I've never read anything like it in 20 years of uh, operations management experience. Okay, so uh, I highly recommend that. And then uh, if you realize that uh, you could use some expertise, in improving the way in which you do things, the order in which you do things. Come talk to us at Cold Star Tech. We'll be glad to hear from you.